Galatians chapter 1 is our scripture today as we continue our walk through God's Word. We go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Galatians, which addresses the subject of the believer and the law. Is it okay for us to eat pork and bacon and catfish? Are we obligated to follow the Sabbath laws of the Old Testament? And if so, which day is the Sabbath? Why don't we offer animal sacrifices anymore like they did in Old Testament times? Is faith in Christ enough to uh, forgive our sin and save our souls and allow us into heaven? Well, these are some of the questions that the book of Galatians answers. And I want to read with you this morning Galatians chapter 1. And we'll read verses 1 through 9. And if it's convenient for you, would you stand please as we show respect to God's word that we read. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren uh, which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father. And from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that has called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto, unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Thank you, and you can be seated. Galatians was written to the churches in Galatia. If you guys have that map, you'll pull up for me. Oh, I don't know if you can see that very well. You can see kind of at the top of the map in the center uh, uh, where it says Galatia. Uh, several years before the time of Christ, there were a group of people who came from what was known as Gaul. That's modern day France, which, which is to the west uh, in, the, in the screen in that map. And they came uh, from there, and they settled into uh, Asia Minor, which is now called Turkey. And uh, that is kind of south of, of uh, Russia, and it's uh, east, I believe, of Romania. So this gives you an idea of the country, the place that we're talking about. It's, uh, it's uh, east of Greece a good ways. But they settled in that area. And it was called Galatia, which means the country of the Gauls. Uh, later on, when the Roman uh, Empire reorganized uh, the world uh, and, the, and the geography, they enlarged the area that in included this, uh, this place that had previously been known as Galatia, and they called this entire province Galatia. On Paul's first missionary journey, he went through the area of Galatia, and he preached the gospel, and when people believed, they were baptized, and he established churches in different places in Galatia, notably at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, and you can read about uh, how this came to be in the book of Acts. Uh, Galatians is the only book in the Bible that's addressed to multiple churches. He says in verse 2, it was written to the churches of Galatia. The other letters or epistles that Paul wrote were addressed to a particular church or a particular group of people. These churches in Galatia were made up primarily of non-Jewish people. And after Paul uh, had formed these churches, he left these churches and behind him, right behind him, came a group of teachers called the Judaizers. The Judaizers were Jewish people who professed to have faith in Christ. They said that they were born again, but they, came, they believed and they came behind Paul who had taught salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And they said, well, it's fine to believe in Christ. That's a good start. But in order 
uh, to be in favor with God, in order for your sins to be forgiven, you also have to keep the Old Testament law. And in order to grow as a Christian, you have to observe the Old Testament ceremonial law and the rituals, or you're not saved. They were trying to add works to the grace of God as a ground and means of salvation, as opposed to the biblical teaching that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ and nothing else. The Judaizers were trying to mix law with grace. And Paul says in the book of Galatians that it is impossible to do that. He's saying in Galatians that salvation is either by grace through faith alone or that it's through works. And he said for them to follow the teachings of the Judaizers was to be brought back under the yoke of the law that the gospel broke people from. Romans eleven six. he gives this explanation. He said either salvation is by grace or it's by works. And he said if it's by works, then it's not by grace. And if it be of works, it's not by grace. He said you have to choose one or the other. Either salvation is by the, the grace of God uh, through faith in Christ or it's through the human works that people do. It can't be both. Because he said, if you mix just a little bit of works in with grace, then it's not grace anymore. Paul said that, and you read what I read here a minute ago, he said very clearly that the message, the gospel, so-called, that the Judaizers were teaching was another gospel, which means a different kind of gospel. And he said that it, he called it a perverted gospel. And he said if, uh, if an angel... Or if I come back to you and I preach a different message than I have preached to you before, the message of salvation by grace through faith, he said, let that man be accursed because he said it's not the true gospel. This passage in the whole book of Galatians really contradicts the idea that's popular today that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It flies in the face of the idea that all religion is good and, and there, uh, each religion is just one of many different ways to God. It contradicts the idea that salvation is by faith plus baptism or faith plus works or faith plus faithfulness or anything else like that. The letter to the Galatians emphasizes the freedom that believers have through faith in Christ. And he, te uh, the, he tells us how the Galatians were being tempted by these Judaizers, these false teachers, to go back and submit themselves to the law which Christ had set them free from. And he cautioned them, do not be entangled again under this yoke of bondage. So what, what is a believer's relationship to the law? What should... What should the Old Testament, what should that mean to us? Well, when, what does the law mean anyway? When we say the law, we're talking about, uh, the. it refers back to the days of the Old Testament. The law was a conditional covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. Where he told them, these are the laws, these are the rules that I command you to live by. And they agreed, they took a vow and said, we agree to accept that and we agree to live by these rules and abide by these rules. The law also refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, which are sometimes called the Torah, T-O-R-A-H. The law, that law included, different. there were different parts of it. There was the moral law which is summarized by the Ten Commandments. It expressed eternal principles of right and wrong. For instance, one of the laws is thou shalt not kill. And it was wrong to kill before God gave the law to Moses because that is eternal principle. It's, it said it's wrong to steal, thou shalt not steal. And before this law was written, it was still wrong to steal something that belonged to someone else because those are expressions of eternal principles of right and wrong that existed before God gave the law to Moses. So was, there was the moral law. There was also the ceremonial law, 
which dealt with the proper worship of God, and it deals it dealt with the priesthood and the tabernacle and then the temple. It dealt with the sacrifices, the offerings, the holy days. It dealt with those dietary restrictions that said they couldn't eat pork or catfish and other different types of food. Um, so under the law, under the Old Testament law, and you have bacon for breakfast today, you broke the Old Testament law. Any of you have a pulled pork sandwich yesterday? You broke the Old Testament law. Any of you wash dishes or cook or, or sweep the floors yesterday on the Sabbath? Well, you broke the Old Testament law. If yesterday, the Sabbath, if you drove or you walked more than 3,000 feet from your house, you broke the Old Testament law. Uh, if today, any of you guys, are you wearing a shirt that's mixed fabric, part polyester and part cotton, you've broken the Old Testament law. Because under the Old Testament law, it said you shout, that you weren't supposed to wear fabrics that were, had mixed material in them. So this Old Testament law, you see, was in quite detail. And this was part of the ceremonial law that in the purpose for some of these restrictions, these dietary restrictions and some things I mentioned, that was that God wanted his people to be different and to show the world around them that they were, that they were different people, that they were God's people. The moral, there was the ceremonial law. There was also the civil law. And there, this is the part where it spells out different rules about uh, uh, inter men's interactions with each other and it talked about the penalties for breaking these laws and what kind of restitution you had to make and different things of that nature. So that's what we mean when we say, when we talk about biblical law, we're talking about this covenant, this conditional agreement that God made with the Israelites as to what ex his expectations for them were. As, we, as Paul writes in Galatians, he points out to us, and in Romans also, Galatians is kind of a, a shortened form of Romans in a lot of ways, he points out the weakness of the law. Now, there's nothing wrong with God's law. He says in Romans 7, 7 12, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. There's nothing wrong with the law itself. The problem with the law is nobody could keep it. Nobody could keep it. James 2.10, he said, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet is, uh, offends it in one point, he is guilty of all. So maybe you don't kill anybody, and maybe you don't steal from anybody, but if you travel 3,001 feet from your house on the Sabbath day, you've broken the law, you're a lawbreaker, and you're a sinner under the law. Uh, if you worked one minute past sundown on Friday night, that's when the Sabbath, Sabbath began Friday night at, at sundown. If you worked one minute past that, you broke the law. You broke the law just like somebody who murdered somebody broke the law. Different law, different results, but the same, same uh, thing is you have broken the law. Man cannot keep the law. So if a Jew violated just one requirement of the law, he was a lawbreaker and he was guilty before God. Men can't keep the law. That's the weakness of it. The law is also weak in that the law never saved anybody. The law never made anybody righteous before God. Look what it says in Galatians 2.16. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we now have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. And then he says, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Get that? No flesh, no person, nobody has ever been justified by trying to keep the law of God. And sometimes people, you ask people about their relationship with God, they say, oh, I live by the Ten Commandments. Okay, the law's good. The question is, do you keep them? Do you keep every one of them? Do you always keep them? And of course, anybody who'd be honest would say no, 
And that means that you can't be saved by, you can't be justified before God by the law because the law cannot save anybody. He repeats it, Galatians 3.11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 2, 2, uh, 10 and 1, he says that the law having a shadow of good things to come uh, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect if offering the sacrifices would make somebody forgiven and perfect and sinless, then why did they have to keep offering them over and over and over? So the law can't save anybody. He says in Galatians that the law is a burden. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He said that the law is a yoke of bondage that weighs people down and ties people down. It's a burden. The law doesn't give life. The law restricts life. And by its punishments, it re reminds people that we are sinners and we are guilty before God. The law pronounces a curse. Galatians 3.10, he says, As many as are, uh, are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. He said, If you do not keep all the things, if they did not keep all the things that are written in the law, then they were under a curse. The law threatens death, and it strikes fear. It doesn't give relief from guilt. He said the law is weak also in that it imprisons people who try to observe it and try to follow it. Galatians 3.23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The law is not a liberator, it's an incarcerator. It's like a jailer that locks you up and keeps the key away from you so that you can't get out. It condemns and confines and it offers no escape from the penalty of sin or from the guilt that goes along with it. You see, the law surrounds men with obligations and restrictions that they cannot possibly keep. And it guards them like a guard watches over a prison cell another weakness of the law is that the law the law was for Jews only and if someone because it was a covenant that God made with the Jews and so if salvation could be by the law which it couldn't be then salvation would be for the Jews only but uh, and so the only way then for a non-Jewish person to be saved would be for him to convert to Judaism and then after that convert to faith in Christ. And so that's basically what the Judaizers were trying to do. They said, well, it's fine to believe in Christ, but you've got to, you've got to become like us. You've got to become a Jew and follow our customs and our rituals and our laws and our rules or you can't, you can't be saved, you can't go to heaven, you can't be right with God. So the law had weakness attached to it, a lot of weaknesses, you can see. What then, well, if the law couldn't save anybody, what was the purpose of it? Why did God put these requirements and these restrictions? Why did he put these standards upon the Jews and ask them, to accept them and to agree to them. Well, it serves several purposes. The law was given, first of all, to reveal sin. Now, probably most of, all, uh, most of us would agree it would not be a good thing if when you leave here today and get out on Knoxville Street that you punch 90 miles an hour going up the street, right? Well, how do we know that? Well, partly it's common sense, but partly... Because there is a speed limit that's posted that says, is it 40? 40 or 45? 40, I think. I probably should know that. <laughs> 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 
But how would you know whether it's all, whether 35 is too fast or 40 is too fast or 50 is too fast unless the limit is posted? And, you know, and then if the policeman pulls you over and said, I'm going to write you a ticket, you're going too fast. If there were no speed limit signs, then you'd say, well, how am I supposed to know that? Well, the purpose of the law is to tell us what the limits and the restrictions are so that we know. Galatians 3.19 he says the law was added because of the transgressions. Uh, Romans 3.20, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh shall be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is like an x-ray. If you fall and hurt your leg and it really hurts, then you're probably going to go to the doctor and the doctor says, and you tell the doctor, my, I fell, my leg hurts, my hip hurts. He's going to feel of it, but then what's he going to do? He's probably going to put you, give you an x-ray. Now, after you get an x-ray, you're not going to come out of there and say, Oh, I had an x-ray. I feel so much better. But the, the, the purpose of the x-ray is not to fix the problem. It's not to heal the broken leg. It's to show you that the broken leg is there. And then the doctor can hold up the x-ray and say, Oh, I see you've got a broken leg. Here's what we need to do to it to make it feel better. And to make it heal. The purpose of the law was to reveal sin. The purpose of the law is to condemn sinners. Romans 3.19, he says that the law, what the law says, it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and that the whole world will be guilty before God. You know, if you talk to people about sin, some people are going to protest and say, Oh, no, you're not talking about me. I'm not a sinner. Well, what does the law say? Have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah. Okay, you're a sinner. You've broken the law. It says so right there. Uh, the purpose of the law is to make us see that we're sinners, and so we stop protesting and stop denying that we're sinners because it's there black and white. It says this is God's law. If you have violated it, you have broken it, and you're guilty. The purpose of the law is to point sinners to Christ. Galatians 3.22, but the scripture has concluded all under sin that, uh, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now the word schoolmaster in our English is a little bit misleading there. What it refers to is that the wealthy people in, in Paul's day uh, they would uh, send their children to, to a tutor, to a schoolmaster, uh, to a school. And if you were wealthy and you had slaves and servants, then the schoolmaster was not actually the person who did the teaching. The term here that says schoolmaster, it refers to the servant, the slave, who would take the child and lead him by the hand through the dangerous streets and take him to the school where the, where the actual teacher would teach him. And so the law was not, he says, was not our actually, actually our teacher, but the law was a slave. The law was a schoolmaster. The law was a servant who would take us and bring us, point, would tell us that we're sinners and that we needed uh, something, and it would point us, it would lead us, it would take us to Christ where we could put our faith and our trust in him. The law was given to prepare people to prepare the nation of Israel for the Savior who would come, to the Christ who would come. And so while in one sense the law was our jailer that kept us locked up, in another way it was our friend because it was able to take us from the recognition, I'm a sinner, I need help, I'm not right before God, and it would lead us and take us and point us to Christ who came and died on the cross to pay for our sins. Galatians 3.21, he says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. He said, no, it's not. Remember in, in Philippi, when Paul and Silas were in prison, had, had been locked up because they upset the people by preaching the gospel of Christ. And in the, at midnight, they were singing praises, and, the, and there was an earthquake, and the 
prison cells fell open and, uh, and the jailer saw what was happening and he was afraid that they were all going to escape and he would be killed because he had not kept them locked up. And he looked at Paul and Silas who had been singing praises to God and he said, what do I what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, you go and get circumcised by the Jewish law, and then you offer these sacrifices, and then you keep all these Ten Commandments, and you don't. No, what did he say to them? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Salvation is not, doesn't come from outward things that we do, but salvation comes from an inward thing that Christ does in our hearts when we put our faith and trust in him. This passage also speaks about the fulfillment of the law. Jesus came and he didn't, you know, there was God's law and then there was, then there was man's interpretations of God's law. For instance, God's law said on the Sabbath you don't do any work. And, uh, and any time men get a hold of a law, and stretch it and strain it. They, for instance, according to, God, according to man's interpretation of God's law, if you wore false teeth on the Sabbath, you were working, and so you have broken God's law. That's what men said. Well, Jesus didn't do, uh, he didn't do everything according to man's interpretation of the law, but uh, they asked him, well, are you trying to destroy the law of Moses? They were trying to pit him against what God's law said. And he said, no, I didn't come to destroy the law of Moses. I came to fulfill it. And how did he do that? Well, he fulfilled the moral law in that the Bible says he did no sin. And it says that he was tempted in all points like we are and yet without sin. Of the only, he's the only person that you could ever rightly say he did not break any of God's moral laws. He never told a lie. He never broke any of those other commandments. Jesus also filled, fulfilled the ceremonial law in that he was God's tabernacle who came and lived among us. John 1, 14, it says, the word that Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt, it literally means, it's a word for tabernacle. And so instead of being, a, instead of the uh, tabernacle and then the man built temple being the place to worship God, Jesus is God's tabernacle who came and lived among us. He is the Lamb of God who took, take away the sin, takes away the sin of the world. He was also the priest who offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice. So Jesus was the tabernacle. He was the priest. He was the sacrifice. He fulfilled God's ceremonial law. He fulfilled God's civil law in that he always treated people rightly. He never mistreated anybody. He never took advantage of anybody. So then, what, where does that put us? What is our relationship? What is the believer's relationship to God's law today? Well, some people, there's a fellow uh, that's on, made a big stew because he's saying he's a, I thought was a conservative Christian preacher, but he's caused a lot of, of uh, waves lately because he's telling people, throw away that Old Testament, you don't need to read that don't need to know what the Old Testament says. I might not be quoting him exactly, but that's kind of what he says. What is our relationship to the law? Well, Paul said, through faith in Christ, we're dead to the law. Galatians 2.19, he said, I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. If we come to faith in Christ, the law, we're dead to the law and the law is dead to us. It, it does, once we come to Christ, the law doesn't serve purpose for us anymore. Believers are redeemed from the curse of the law. The curse said if you break the law, you die physically and you die eternally. you be separated from God forever. But he says, Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. How did Jesus redeem us from the law? He went to a tree. He was hung on a cross. 
And it says that when he did that, he became sin for us, though he knew no sin. He became the sacrifice for sinners. And he bore the curse of the law. Believers in Christ are freed from the law. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So, if, you're, if you are in Christ through faith in Him, you are dead to the law, you're redeemed from the law, you're freed from the law, and the law and the consequences of breaking the law are not on you anymore. John 1.17 reminds us, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Galatians 2.21, Paul says that if, if salvation were by the law, then Christ died in vain. He says if a person could be saved by doing good deeds and trying to keep the law, then it served absolutely no purpose for Christ to come down on the cross. And he, said, and he said, you know, that makes no sense at all, that God would allow Jesus to come down on the cross if we could be saved some other way. It doesn't make any sense. It would serve no purpose. So, I would say to you today, if this fits you, stop. There's no need to die denying that you are a sinner. The Bible says so. And if you compare your life, and your actions, and your attitudes by what God's law says, you would see that we are all guilty lawbreakers. I would say to you today that when you recognize that you're a sinner... You need to stop trying to do things to justify yourself in the sight of God, to make your sins go away, to earn you favor with God, because he said nobody has ever been and nobody ever will be made right, be justified in the sight of God by trying to do good things. You can't do it. I would say to you today, that if you are today are trusting anything except Christ's death on the cross to take away your sins and forget you and get and to get you into heaven, you're trusting the wrong thing. Paul says if anybody preaches a different gospel than salvation by grace through faith, it's not a gospel, it's not God's gospel. He, he said that it is a perverted gospel. And he said, whoever tells you something like that, uh, let him be accursed. So he's saying that you need, don't trust faith plus works. Don't trust faith plus baptism. Don't trust faith plus being a member of a church. Don't trust faith plus anything else. But our only hope and our only promise of how we can get into heaven is to trust what Jesus did for us on the cross and to trust his victorious resurrection. Well, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to go away and say, well, the preacher said we can trust Christ and then live any way we want to. No, that's not what I said. Because he also teaches us in Galatians and we'll probably talk about this in a couple of weeks, that the liberty that we have through faith in Christ is not license or it's not permission to live any way we want to. But what our freedom in Christ does, it gives us freedom to enjoy our relationship with God without fear and without dread. And it allows us the freedom and it gives us the power to do what we ought to do and not what we want to do if those two things are ever different. Some would say that the grace of God is permission, again, to, 
to say I believe in Christ and then to continue in sin. But he, he, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And salvation by grace through faith is not a deterrent to living right and doing the right things and doing good things, but it is incentive to do so. Like the little poem I heard a long time ago, a fellow said, I cannot work my soul to save, for that my Lord hath done, but I will work like any slave for the love of his dear son. It is not fear that motivates a Christian to do right and live right, but it is gratitude and thanks that causes the believer in Christ to do what God says and to live right. So I want Sean to come. We're going to come and have our hymn of commitment today. And I want to tell you, I know what it's like. As a young man, I knew I was a guilty sinner. And I tried everything I could think of to do to make myself right with God. And I ended up frustrated and doubting and fearful. And it, that never went away until I came to trust totally in Christ and what he had done. So st don't deny that you're a sinner. Stop trying to figure out what you can do to make your sins go away and to give you peace with God. And just trust Christ and give yourself to him. And if you are a child of God and you've trusted Christ, then dedicate your life to living a life that shows your gratitude to him for what he's done. You stand blessing.